Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, I'm Ron Holt. I'm the CEO and founder of Two Maids in a Mop, which uh, obviously is a residential cleaning service. We're based in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we have 88 stores open for business today, uh, with the bulk of those being franchise operations. We have two corporate stores and 86 franchises open. Woo! Ah, such <laughs> big numbers there. So exciting. Yeah, thank uh, you. You recently were in the news for something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're uh, we're pretty proud of this. So you know, our our history dates back seventeen years almost. April one of this year, well, April Fool's Day of all days, will be our seventeenth year anniversary. And we opened in Pensacola, Florida, seventeen years ago. And that first year of operations, we did a hundred thousand dollars in sales. And I remember thinking, man, what would it be like to just be like the best cleaning service in Pensacola, Florida? And I would meet these, you know, owners across town and was just so envious. And fast forward to today, um, and Entrepreneur Magazine just uh, just a couple weeks ago named us part of the Franchise 500. And within that, that basically means we're one of the top five residential cleaning brands in the whole country. It's just crazy to think that I, I wanted to be in the top five in Pensacola 17 years ago. And now someone thinks we're the top five in America. You are, yeah. <laughs> And, and that's not the only time that you have been uh, recognized in Entrepreneur and also Inc., right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we've, we've won all sorts of awards, more awards than I ever thought existed. Um, there is an actual fastest growing cleaning company designation. And for three consecutive years, we were named that by Inc. Magazine. Um, oh, then, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Three years in a row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So, well, it's because you're probably like me. You didn't know that award existed. So, <laughs> <laughs> It's true. I didn't. Well, I did read up on it a little bit. So I found out that you had won, but I did not recognize that you had won three years in a row. I mean, that's even more impressive. I mean, yeah, well, growing it's... one year makes sense, but two more years, <laughs> even, even more impressive. Well, yeah, well I mean, thank you. With that number, what would you say, 88? Total? Of 88 stores opened across the country today, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it makes sense that it's going to have to be pretty fast growing to get to 88 in, what, 17 years, 16, almost 17? Yeah, almost 17 okay. years. I started when I was 12, so that's yeah. <laughs> Well, you're looking good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> uh, so why, why, why do you think that Two Maids and Mop has been so successful? So that's a good question. Uh, I, you know, to, to answer that real quickly in, a, in, a, in, a, in like a series of bullet points, I mean, first and foremost, there's something that, about our company that is just completely different than most other cleaning services. A lot of, I say that in a very positive way because I know a lot of people in the industry and I think very highly of, of uh, you know, you and, and lots of other people in the industry and everyone has so many good, really good ideas. But one of the things that allowed us sort of separate ourselves within most of the local markets that we compete is this compensation plan that we've always kind of sort of leaned on called the pay for performance plan. So every time we clean a house, we give our customers an opportunity to rate their level of satisfaction on a pretty simple scale of just one to 10. And that number by itself will directly determine the actual compensation level for the two people who clean that house. So I've been saying that for going on 17 years now. And almost every time we say it, whether it's to a franchise candidate or a consumer at the local level, it's different enough to sort of um, to be unique and remarkable. And um, it usually works as a very unique selling tool for us. So that, that is the first, uh, probably most foremost thing that kind of separates us from, from a lot of people in the industry. Uh, second, you know, franchising is a unique business uh, because it's our brand, it's our business model. We train and support it. But it's, it's really managed by a lot of small business owners. In our case, you know, 86 small business owners across the country. And so what we've learned over the last several years is what we want, um, why they want to be in business. And, and that has really allowed us to attract a pretty high quality uh, business owner who has just a lot of hustle behind him. I, I try to find as many franchisees sort of like me as possible that's sort of got their inner hustle or, you know, refuse to lose mentality. And uh, I, mean, I know that's sort of a subjective kind of measure, but there's just so many of us in, in the Two Maids in the Mop world that really, really want to shake things up. And, uh, 
and make things happen. And so that, that mentality rubs off on everybody that it's, you know, we're connected to. And, um, you know, since our, our business is such a, it's built on trust, that permeates throughout every one of the local communities that we serve. And I, and I think that's a big reason for the growth. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, and I, I have to add a little bit to that because I really saw that. I have been at a couple of your national events and you bring in all of the different franchise owners and, you know, give away awards and this big thing. And, you know, I, I think that I was expecting for a lot of these type of events that I've gone to, it's all party. And not to say your event wasn't a party, because it absolutely was a party. But on top of the party, there was still hustle. People were still talking about their businesses, what they were doing, how they were changing while they're partying. So right. I, I really saw the hustle that you're talking about. It wasn't just, you know, it's not just from eight to five, I'm really going to push and grow my business. No, this is, hey, right in the middle of a party, I'm winning an award. Great. <laughs> what are you doing? What is, what's working great for you? I mean, it was. Well, thank it was you. Great. Yeah. I, I've always believed uh, in the work hard, play hard philosophy. And so I, I think that's uh, sort, of, sort of permeated throughout our, our, our network as well. And so we yeah. do have, we do have a lot of fun. Uh, but when it's time to get serious, we, we, we get busy and we get our hands dirty. Hard and yeah. fun. Yeah, I, I, I did see that too. Yeah. Uh, another thing that you talked about was your pay for performance plan. And I, I think that I would agree with you that this is a huge selling point and a differentiator. And I'm starting to hear a little bit of people talking about pay for performance. And I mean, that's always been around pay for performance. Yeah, sure. Right? But not in the way that you do it, where their pay is directly related to what the customer is rating their, their performance. And I've seen over the years, people try different versions of this and not, not have success <laughs> and, and really struggle. So, I mean, I guess 17 years, you have kind of perfected this and yeah. you've made it. So it was a built somewhat out of desperation. And so I entered the industry forever ago, uh, again, when I was 12. And when I entered the industry, I had all these just high hopes and big visions, right? Just like I had a, I had a dream of disrupting the industry, but I didn't know anything about it, you know? And so I just jumped in and I thought, if I just work harder than everyone else, that's really all that's needed. And the business will just roll in, you know? And that didn't happen. It, 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 it took a long time for me to really figure out how to get the phones to ring. And even harder, I, I'm not a drill sergeant kind of manager. I'm very much a cheerleader and, you know, pat you on the back and, and try to uplift and motivate versus discipline. And that, um, that was not working well for me early on because all the work's out in the field, like we all know. And I needed to, I needed to really be on top of everyone early on and I needed to be stronger. But that's just not me. That's not my personality. I want to, I want to go climb a mountain together I don't want to fight someone to force them to do it you know so yeah. I uh, I said I've got to be a better manager but I knew that wasn't me so I had to figure out a way to motivate my people in a way that would be self-motivating and so that's how the pay for performance plan was sort of mm. created um, again kind of out of desperation and it, what turns out you know it, it, it really became the cornerstone for the rest of our life and in my personal life even um, it still continues today. The DNA is very much the same as it was from those early days. It's, it looks different in terms of how we execute and how we actually pull it off is, um, is easier and more automated today versus using the abacus, you know, the, the, or the you know, little old school calculator. Yeah, yeah, that's what we had to do in the early days. You, really, you needed to know calculus to pull it off. But uh, nowadays, it's, it's really just data entry and it kind of does the work for you. But it's uh, what it what I've learned. Uh, you know, it is a unique selling tool, and it gets a lot of people in the door because we just everything I just talked to you about with you. We talk with a prospective client, and it works. But it, what it also does is it really elevates the expectations from our customers. They really believe that because we have this pay for performance plan, and our employees are paid based on their their feedback. Yeah, their expectation level is is higher than it is with most cleaning companies. Yeah. We had to adjust to that because we didn't react to it very well early on because we were just, we were the same company 
um, but we didn't really provide the best experience. And so we felt like our job was to clean the house and leave and do it again two weeks later. Um, what we've had to do is really um, figure out what the customer journey looks like and then try to elevate and, and meet those expectations because people do have that expectation from us. We, they expect more from us than almost any other cleaning company they've ever hired because of that pay for performance. Pay. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Can you elaborate a little bit more on one of the things you said was that you didn't realize you were going to have to manage this customer relationship. You thought you were just going to have to clean houses. So right. what, what does that look like? I, I think that most cleaning business owners would say, that is what we do. We do just clean houses. So yep. Can you explain right. that a little bit more? Yeah, so this hit me a few years ago. Um, I, uh, as we started franchising, I, had, I became farther and farther disconnected from the local operations. And so I was talking really high level stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm a small business guy at heart, at heart. And so I wanted to try to sort of get back to the roots. And so I picked a day to clean houses. And so this is a true story. So you I went out personally. Yeah, this was five, six years ago. And so I cleaned the house or actually cleaned uh, two houses that day. And both, co both customers complained. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> it was pretty critical actually. And so, and I put, I put blood, you know, not blood, but I put a lot of sweat into both of those homes and I was proud of the work, but yet they complained. And so when I went back, he was asked, let me own this. Let me go back and let me talk to the, the homeowner and let them ex explain the situation. And they were right. Uh, it wasn't perfect. When they pointed out some of the areas, there were some things I could have done, but my back hurt and I knew I worked hard that day. So it wasn't because I cared less. It was just because I'm imperfect like everyone is. And so it hit me that day. If, if I can go into a home and give it everything I got, and still make mistakes and have complaints, then I know everyone that works for me can have those days as well. And since I can't automate perfection, I needed to figure out a different way for a client to look past those mistakes when they were bound to occur. Uh, and that's sort of how, what got us started on the road of creating a journey, a customer journey, and documenting every piece of that journey along the way from when they book to before the cleaning, during the cleaning, after the cleaning, and everything in between, we wanted to create a systemized process that could be streamlined and uniform, no matter if you're in Spokane, Washington, or Miami, Florida. And so it's, it's taken us a long time to get there, and we're, it, when it comes to customer experience, it's never ending, you know, so we're still working on it. Uh, but that's what we've, that's sort of the, the genesis of how we started thinking more about the experience behind what we provide versus the quality of the cleaning. Mm -hmm. I love that that uh, that customer journey um, exercise is something you hear a lot about, but you don't hear a lot about people actually doing it, right? right. <laughs> you hear that you should do it, but not necessarily that you do. You know, the, I think the easiest way to think about it is almost do what I did, except maybe revert it. Think of yourself as brand new to the industry. We get so stuck in our industry that it's hard sometimes for us to think about the first day we were in it. Um, like I was almost 17 years ago. So if you were to walk into this business today, even if you've owned it for 20 years, what would you do with a fresh mind and a fresh perspective without all the history behind you? And if you can open your mind up to that way of thinking, you're usually going to be able to see some weaknesses that you can exploit, you know, when it, but what most people do, me included, is you get so mired and stuck in day to day, just nuances of running a business, all the weaknesses, you're, you're hidden from you because you're just trying to survive to get to the next day. Yeah. And, and you can get into a rhythm and a pattern of everything going along really smoothly. And so you don't even notice what some of those problems are that it just seems normal to have some of these things. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so as you're doing this exercise, I, I like that you say that, you know, you drop yourself into your business. And okay, what would I do if I was dropped in fresh today? How often would you say that you look at your business that way and try to think that way? Well, so I'm the like prototypical entrepreneur, which means pretty much every day I have a new idea. Sometimes yeah. they're bad. Uh, you know, 
Um, sometimes people say, well, who's going to pull that off, Ron? And I realize that I've probably dreamed too big and too often. Uh, but in terms of dream sort of assessment, you know, in the franchise world, our franchise partners are just that. They're business partners with us. And so they demand a lot out of, uh, out of us, out of me, uh, specifically. Yeah. So it, I'm pretty much, that's almost my entire job is to, is to figure out a way almost on a daily basis to reinvent ourselves. Um, we, if, we, if we get too stuck in how we've always done things, somebody else is right behind us. Uh, it, it, it wasn't always that way. One of the reasons I even chose this industry is because I felt like it wasn't going to move very fast. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's moved a lot in those 16 or 17 years I've been in it, but it, in the last three to four years, there's been a lot of new people, a lot of big money entering, entering the industry, and I can feel the impact from that. You know, it's really forcing people differently about what we do. So I, I, I honestly, I, I try to never go to sleep on future, you know, and, and try to stay in front as much. And some of that, some of that means copying other people, not necessarily copying other cleaning companies, but other home service based industries that are doing things right. In some cases, I mean, even look at retail and uh, restaurant, the restaurant yeah. space and see what's working there and see if we can copy that inside our own business. Yeah. And bringing that new information that is, makes great sense. So when you're doing this, that, like you said, you've got 88 different business partner -y type people and they're looking to you to sort of set the vision and the plan and to make sure that everything's running smoothly and I have seen the same thing in the last three to four years that there's been some disruption there are some new players things are moving much more quickly where do you see things going in the future what do, what are you looking at five years yeah out? all positive I, I you know I know there's a lot of fear because of the, of the capital that's coming into the industry and um, all of the technology sort of disruptions that are entering enter the industry. To me, that's a real opportunity for brands um, that really have high integrity, that have a real vision for their own future. It, it allows for the entire industry to be lifted upwards. Right now, we're almost kind of dragged down, you know, and so when you look at the history of our industry, 90 plus percent of our industry is comprised of mom and pop operators. When I say mom and pop, it's usually just one person, right? I mean, mom and pop. Um, and so with that, become, you know, obviously they're offering a service at a lower price, but they're also a really poor quality service as well. There's very little professionalism, lots of crazy things happen in this industry that no one else would tolerate as a customer in another industry. And that, since 90% of the industry is comprised of those mom and pops, it really pulls the industry down um, which is good and bad. I mean, the good is that means we only have to do a few things right to really look good. Um, but the bad is it really makes it difficult for a company like you and, and us to kind of stand up and say, we're worth more than that um, because so many people are out there charging such low rates because of their cost of business is so low. I believe that with all the new um, money entering the industry, that's going to create more competition for us but it's going to be really positive competition because it's going to lift everybody up instead of, instead of pulling down. So, you know, I, uh, I am actually on the opposite of what most people probably think because I'm super excited about it. I really want more and more people to enter the industry to validate what we're all doing, which means the professionals, like, you know, everyone listening to this, pod, this, this interview, uh, will really stand out in their local community, in my opinion. Yeah, at least there's a much better opportunity, right? So, yeah, I, I agree with you. In the past, it's always been us trying to drag, you know, a certain, a small portion of the industry trying to drag the industry forward where now we're getting a, an appreciable amount of people that are in the front instead of behind that are driving it forward and it's getting that little bit of, of right. momentum going behind us. So it is really exciting. I, I agree with you there. It, and not only that, it, you know, for some of these companies like Amazon and Google to try to enter this space, mm -hmm. that tells you something. There's yeah. a tremendous amount of demand out there, and they see it. They wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't invest the money or the time to do what they're doing without recognizing the demand. And so, again, that's a really good thing. Amazon could be the most popular cleaning service in the world, and there's still another home to clean for us. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I, I welcome all those guys because it's it's only going to lift all of us up. 
Yeah. And they can do it faster. They have proven that they can do it faster, right? <laughs> they can they make can. big change really quickly. So right, right. They got a few extra bucks than, than most of us. Yeah, a little bit more money to invest, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of that, real quick, uh, one of the things that I was looking at when I was reading about your bio and what you guys have done is a lot of times this will happen to business owners, and it seems like it's happened to you as well, where we'll work really, really hard for years and years and years and years, and then all of a sudden there is like a tipping point where things just all of a sudden matter yep. and they make the difference. I saw in 2018, you were listed as number 11 on entrepreneurs top 100 new franchises. Yeah. Okay? And I thought that was really interesting. It's like, it took what, 15, 16 years for you to yeah. be even noticed. And now you're new. And this is all, right? That's a lot of work going into that new status there. Right. Well, so a couple things. So in today's world, entrepreneurship means six months. <laughs> you know, yeah. I started an app and it took me six months of hard work to really make it happen. Yeah. Um, we're different. You know, we're, we're the old school business that started from the ground and bootstrapped themselves to the top and, you know, with that means it just, it, it's going to take us longer. You know, we, I, nobody was dying to give me money during those early days uh, to, to fund this venture. And, uh, you know, I had to, I had to use my own funds and eventually cash flow the business to, to invest in the future. So it, it was going to take longer mainly because of that. It, it was a blessing in disguise because it's, it's really forced me to know everything about our business. I cannot write code, but outside of writing code, I know everything about our business um, from A to Z literally from cleaning to the marketing to service and so on. Um, and so I, I think that that's one thing that I'm proud of is that I'm not, you know, I, I sort of bucked that trend. You even, you know, you bucked that trend as well, that we've, we're the, we, we're winning the marathon, not the sprint. And to, to me, that's, that's the better one to win because it is yeah. a long term game, you know? So yeah. that's, okay. that's one, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh no, hopefully I'm just with you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you that it's, hopefully it's a long, it's a long play, not a, a short little sprint there right right and you know the other is we so we didn't know pivoting was this cool word uh, until recently but we have pivoted <laughs> multiple times throughout our our 17 years so the pay for performance plan was the biggest pivot early on mm -hmm. uh, but even when it came to marketing we we were in markets where we were nobody you know we didn't nobody knew we existed and we had no customers and we had little capital even even during our high growth years early on we still had limited amount of capital because we were pouring everything back into the business yeah. we could just throw a bunch of money into a market and just say magically let's outspend everyone else we still had less money than they did so we had a, a pivot many years ago where we shifted from an offline marketing uh, business model to nothing but digital so social pay-per-click and so on and nowadays in 2020, that's like yesterday's news. But back in those days, we were very much in the forefront of that movement. And so the, the pivots kind of have continued over the years, even with franchising. We went from corporate stores. At one point, we had 12 corporate stores. And we pivoted to just focus on nothing but franchising, which is a whole other industry. You know, yeah. it's, we had only known how to build a cleaning business and make money from that. And then all of a sudden, we had to figure out how to attract a franchise candidate, to sell to a franchise candidate, how to support and train a franchise candidate. And whether we were cleaning houses or making burgers, we had to, we had to learn all those nuances that were brand new to us. And so I, uh, I think that that has been very helpful for us as well, that even though we've, it's taken us a while, it's forced us to sort of pivot along the way. And it means, sort of creates this perpetual startup mentality around here. Um, people that we hire today don't know a whole lot about my story from 2003, but they also feel like we're just getting started in 2020, which is crazy. You know, it's just crazy. We, we should be like this grandfather business, but in most of the people's eyes that work here, we're still just this little baby trying to, trying to be the underdog and beating everyone else, you know, so. But that's exciting too. It's a way to keep that momentum going. So I, I saw that energy when I was at your events of 
we're, you know, we're growing, we're trying to build this baby. I, I saw that and that it's inspiring. It's motivational. Uh, tell me, tell me about your 2020 two maids in a mop. What are they doing in 2020? Well, we, we think we have a real opportunity to ramp up our growth. Um, historically, meaning the last three or four years, we've targeted 20 or so new stores to be opened in the course of a year. Um, we think that with the momentum we've got behind us and in front of us, that we could actually double that. And so um, in 21, we hope to open 40 new stores. In 20, we hope to open 30 new stores. Uh, we think it's possible. It's super ambitious. We've never done it before. Um, and we may fail, which is okay. Um, but that's a big goal, and that's what we're shooting for. And, and then on, on the other side, uh, really yeah. just affecting the, the experience for our employees and for our customers at the local level. So once we get, you know, there's one step to selling a franchise, mm -hmm. but a bigger step is getting those guys to profitability yeah. and they yeah. create enough cash flow so a franchisee can really live a, a strong work life, have a strong work life balance. And so that's sort of a, a goal number two, maybe yeah. one B is a better way to say it, is to create a better business model that makes business grow while making the business owner's life easier, which is, which is not the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Usually yeah. growth means work. Uh, we're trying to create growth with less work, um, but that's, that's our ultimate goal is to, to create a business model where people are making money without working as hard as they have in the past. Yeah, that's great. And anytime you're trying to strengthen your business model, how can you go wrong now, right? So. Right. Well, do you have any hot markets or are there, are there, is there such a thing as hot markets or bad markets for franchising or for? Yeah, you know, tip for us, we want to be somewhere around 150 to 200,000 households. Uh, we want, we want at least a third of those to be what we call qualified. So if we can get, um, if we can get 50,000 qualified homes, and we think we can build a million dollar business around that. Uh, most of our markets are a bit larger than that. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our territories are somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 plus thousand qualified households, but we've also operated in markets where we have less than 100,000 and done very well. In fact, our, our best performing store has uh, around 60,000 qualified households. So uh, that's, that's sort of what we're looking for in terms of specific markets, um, you know, we're, most of our growth early on was in the Southeast because we're in Birmingham, Alabama. And so organically, we just spread here because of that. We are now um, looking at out West and Midwest. And that's where most of the opportunity is because there's only a few markets left in, in the South. Still a lot in Texas, still a lot in New England, uh, Midwest and out West. There's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. And so we don't have one single territory that we just got to be in. Uh, yeah. Selfishly speaking, maybe Omaha, Nebraska, just because my, my hero is Warren Buffett, and I'd love to have a reason to go and travel to Omaha. <laughs> but, <laughs> but outside of that, we, we're open to anything. Ah, nice. So it sounds like you guys have some big plans coming up there. What, who, so I know we're, we're, we're tight on time here, but what, um, what are you looking for in a franchise owner? I know that you want that drive and that passion, and little bit of grit and enthusiasm yeah. um, um, but is there anything else that you're looking for from from these people or some or the right type of person that would be great sure. for a franchise versus independent yeah and so there's there's a few practical things we look at uh, tactical thing maybe is a better way to describe it one you got to be financially qualified you know this is an investment first uh, a business pretty close second but it is an investment which means you're going to pay us and also need to have working capital to subsidize the business as it grows and, and, and reaches positive cash flow. So what we look for is someone to have liquid capital of at least $150,000. So that means they either have personal cash or they have access to capital. And that's where most of our branches, what they do, they source financing through 401k uh, rollovers to SBA um, financing opportunities. We have a fast track with the SBA that allows for anyone that connects with us, as long as they have proper credit, to receive $150,000 worth of operating capital because of our brand. We've already been we've already been uh, approved by them to do that. That's where most what most people do. 
So outside of that, what we look for is the things you just said. I want to, I want to have, I want someone to have a reason that this business is going to make their life better. So we ask people to provide us with a purpose and a mission beyond just making a dollar bill. Everybody wants to start a business and make money. Yeah. 90% of people who do that fail. And so if every, if we know that everyone wants to make money, but most don't, then, then the best business owners have to figure out a way to create a purpose and a mission behind their business beyond. So we, we try to really dig deep into the, the history, the personal history of our franchise candidates. And we ask some pretty sensitive questions, but really what we're trying to do is figure out, are they ready for the, are they ready for the fight? You know, we're going to try to make life easier for them, but it's still not going to be easy. And so that mental fortitude has to be strong um, or they'll lose, they'll quit and give up and then they'll, they'll fail and lose money. And so we push people hard during the, the discovery process to see what kind of mental fortitude they do have. Um, and then, you know, the only other thing we kind of look at is what type of success have they had in the past? We mm -hmm. one that doesn't necessarily mean they had to own a business. Uh, it doesn't even mean that they have to, to had to manage people in the past, uh, but they've had to, they need to have had some success in their past, whether it's a career where there's been a lot of success, where there's um, high levels of education where they've attained that, um, or even if there's something in their personal life. But if we can, if we can see there's, there's been a battle in their life that they've won, um, then that tells us when they hit our, when they, when they fight with us, then they'll win too in, in their local market. Ah, yay. Nice. I didn't know that. I'm, I'm glad I asked that question. That's uh, a, a great answer. And I, yeah. I'm not sure that I would have thought of that, that you're looking for the people that have fought a battle and, and won. I and mean, it makes perfect sense, but I just I didn't go there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know how, whether it's a cleaning business or a restaurant, business is, is, is a battle. It's a, almost yeah. like a war, right? And so, but the war is not with your competitors. It's, it's with yourself, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, your brain is going to tell you to quit at some point if you start a business because logically when you lose money and you feel pain from that loss of money you either try to fix it or run away from it so logically we're supposed to run away when we start a business and quit so the dumbest people in the world are probably entrepreneurs because we resist that logic and we keep fighting and we keep doing the things that our brain says don't do um, so i want to see people that have dealt with adversity in the past and persevered um, because that tells me that we've got a chance to, to win with them once they open. Yeah. And so I'm guessing along with that, that you don't get really turned off by failures as long as there's also successes. Because I think we all recognize that highly successful people also have many failures. <laughs> Typically right. Absolutely. Have failures, right? In their past. So the failures are not so much a, a warning to you unless there's not the commensurate success. Right. So, so one of our best performing franchisees had failure in his life, but it was the right kind of failure. And so this particular franchisee um, operates a million dollar store in our network right now. And um, he's only been in the business for about three and a half years. So he came to us after running, he, he was the licensee, which is some of the franchising, but he was the licensee for a car rental business. And he did really well in that business so well, that the corporate brand that he worked with stripped the license agreement with him and pulled it out you know, from under him. And he was out of a business, out of a job, out of income, everything, literally overnight. And he called us, he told us the story. And we said, we love you, let's do this. But his failure was not reading, not really preparing himself. For what happens when I build this business into success? Can I, am I protected? Yeah. And so obviously the work was there, it wasn't that he didn't work and it wasn't that he wasn't successful inside the business, but the preparation um, and just the sort of uh, due diligence that was needed yeah. wasn't there. He was just too blind to it, too, too excited about it. So, you know, we've had people that have failed in the past, but it's got to be the right kind of failure. You know, if it's someone failed because they just weren't involved in their business, we're going to have a hard time. That's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes good sense. Yeah. Walter, anything else you'd like to share with the uh, CBT audience today, Ron, that you think of? Other than you're amazing. You know, you have been at um, a couple of different of our events. You've been on a podcast interview with us. And I am so proud to call you and Derek and everybody there friends, you know, and that's ultimately what I think 
you know, all of us in the industry, I hope, can really rally around is that we're we're not competitors with one another. You know, we we should be partners with one another. Um, and I think that the the better the more we can really react to each other in that way, embrace that concept, the better it is for all of us and our businesses. And so, um, you know, I'm proud to to be uh, talking to you right now and, and and working with you in the past. And I hope to do it again. Um, every time I talk to you, I learn something. So. Um, Thank you for giving me that. What about you? A, a, a great thing that we do have in this industry, too. I think we have a lot of opportunity to. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks so much, Ron. I appreciate your taking the time with me today. And you I look forward to seeing you through 2020, seeing what's Let's going on. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Thanks That's again. Cool. Thanks. Bye bye.